So uh, today uh, I'm joined by Nick from CCB Games. Um, so Nick, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm the uh, technical director of infrastructure for EVE Online and CCB Games. Uh, but basically all of that means all of the, the low level pieces around running EVE Online, such as the data center and cloud providers and that type of thing. Awesome. And I'm Liz Fong Jones, and I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb, where I help Honeycomb customers and the broader ecosystem get better observability into their systems. So why don't we start, Nick, why don't you uh, explain to us for the people who don't know what EVE Online is, like, what's the game about? Like, what's kind of the, uh, what's the crux of it? Oh, man. Uh, compressing all of EVE down into that, that's going to be tough. I know. Um, Your marketing so game is a hard job. <laughs> so, so EVE Online is, uh, is basically an MMO that kind of kind of grew into its own culture, its own ecosystem. Um, some key points about it is, is you know, the, the free market that exists inside the game itself, um, like to the point of being very sensitive to us saying anything out loud. We can literally watch the market while devs are talking about it in a live stream and watch it fluctuate up and down as people say different things. Yeah, this um, morning there was a announcement that um, one of the payout values for an item was being changed and the price just immediately like went like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, my yeah. Were talking about it this morning. But yeah, right, like it's it's a sandbox, right? Like it is one of, yep. it is the one of the first sandbox MMOs. Um, and maybe you can describe like one of the unique things that like always blew my mind about Eve is that it's like not instanced. Like what what does no, that so mean? It, 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 it's not like it's not like when you when you play other MMOs, it's like it's what server are you playing on so I can play with you. If you're playing Eve, you're you're playing with everyone else. Uh, and that's kind of its unique claim to fame. Um, in the sense that has allowed us to like, you know, set some Guinness World Records with biggest online battles. Um, and it allows everyone to interact in the same market that that free market that we're talking about where everybody can participate in that and kind of build their own uh, legacy, if you will. Uh, there's so many stories that come out of that. Uh, I still think that's one of my favorite Eve trailers um, where we basically took some of the actual live comms from people playing Eve and kind of replayed that in more uh, cinematic moments, as it were. Um, and it, a lot of people tell a lot of different stories. And I, I know a ton of people who are like, I don't play Eve, but I will read every single story that comes out of Eve uh, from all of the nonsense that goes on there. Yeah. So I think, I think pertinently, one of the interesting things from a scalability perspective is that when someone requests to join a system, they can join, try to join the system, right? Like there's no, there's no caps on systems. Um, like if people want to pile into a fight, they can pile into a fight um, subject to the technical limitations of the system. Yeah, so like it's, it's interesting because of the way that EVE works, like one of the key kind of mechanisms of EVE is location. Uh, and kind of the tenets of the design is that if you have something, it can be stolen or destroyed or moved somewhere else. And so you get into these situations where these large fights are more about, a, a lot of it is about logistics and preparing for the fight, moving people into a staging solar system to get to the actual fighting solar system and being able to reinforce and, and reinforce your front lines and also the people that are on the front lines. Um, but yeah, it, it, then piling all of those people in, uh, we've made a lot of concessions in that regard in the sense of uh, one of the techniques that was employed quite a few years ago is called time dilation, uh, where we got to the point where the server was trying to basically calculate so many different things going on in the solar system that we, instead of it basically eating up a bunch of memory and eventually falling over, we slowed down time so it, the CPU could catch up and keep track of everything that's going on up to yet another limit. So that just basically moved the bar a bit higher so that it became operational so people could actually keep playing the game because it's more important that you can finish those engagements rather than crash out of them ultimately. Yeah. And this game now is 20 years old, right? Like that's the, uh, the subject line, right? Like we recently celebrated 20 years of EVE Online. So what is you know what are some of the consequences of that like what what does it what does it mean when you're trying to deliver features to players i i never <laughs> i never understood the sci-fi trope of oh it's arcane technology and no one knows how it works how it works but we'll kind of piece it together and it'll make it do this and then i started working on eve online and knew exactly what that meant all of a sudden because there's this very uh 
dense ecosystem of all of these different features and things that Eve can interact with and how all these ecosystems interoperate with one another. And then it just kept growing and growing and growing with the same mechanisms and techniques and development strategies. And it just kept piling on and, and, and this, you know, from that culture, this monolith kind of organically just kept growing. Uh, and it's from that where you understand that like, it's like, okay, well, I make a call here. How does it know how to go there? And there's maybe five people in the company that know the answer to that question. Um, but then over time, as we started adding more observability to the systems of like metrics and tracing, it became this interesting spotlight on kind of almost an archeology span uh, expedition of like, how does this actually work? How do these pieces actually fit together? Even if the person has long since left the company five years ago, you can still figure it out. Yeah, and maybe even figure out stuff like, uh, you know, Helmar and I, the CEO of CCP, we, we talk about this because he was one of the original ones that wrote a lot of the code that's there. And, and you know, we'll find stuff with things like Honeycomb and be like, Helmar, did you know this worked this way? He's like, oh yeah. <laughs> and like remind him of how that was actually made. And then he'll probably give us a, four stories on why that was the case. and what happened in the in right the we always do things days. subject to the technical constraints oh, that we yeah. have at the time it's not that people are meaning to do a bad job it's that you know yeah, yeah, you're, you're, a, you're a startup at the time like you you've self-funded by by selling a board game in iceland you know yeah. you kind of got to accumulate some technical debt along the way absolutely um and yes uh in case people didn't know um i am also a fairly avid eve online player and also um nick is uh ccp chimichanga in game um although i understand that he doesn't end off much um certainly he doesn't have a kill board <laughs> um but yeah so you know in interest of full disclosure like you know i am i am an avid eve online player and it's really exciting to see kind of two of my passions observability and eve online kind of intersect and collide in this in this in this fun and awesome way cool um so nick why don't you describe to us kind of the you were talking about the kind of the complexity of the monolith and kind of how it came together over 20 years to be this like pile of goo like what's your stack so uh, there's there's more slides that we threw out of this for the sake of like having time to really talk about stuff. But ultimately, like in the beginning, it was an MSSQL server, a a what we call a soul node, which is the location nodes and what deals with actual like simulation that's happening, and then proxy nodes. And there's various other versions of soul nodes and various other services. Uh, then we have proxies which clients connect to, uh, and then you started evolving with the different technologies. Started uh, kind of coming up uh, like OAuth 2 became a thing and HTTP 2 became, or sorry, HTTP uh, became more prevalent. And so we started adding things into that ecosystem that allowed for federated logins, those types of things. Really early on, the third party APIs were just a read only XML API. Uh, and this was actually, I had to fact check a couple of these things with some people remembering really old things, but ultimately originally the, the problem was is that I think they were posting data on forums or wiki pages originally, and they were just being scraped until they just crashed. So then they exposed all of that data on XML API to give people programmatic access to it. And so proper caching and those types of things that evolved. Right, because into, people had data mined the client to figure out what yeah, calls it was making. Yeah, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, well, I mean, and then they were getting all the, like all the raw data was being talked about on forums and, and on wiki pages that was originally hosted uh, by CCP. Um, and then they exposed that and then that kept evolving and people kept talking about like, what if we had a right API? Uh, and then that's when Crest came along, which is basically the hypermedia restful uh, paradigm of everything has a link to everything else and you can traverse a tree programmatically, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and so this is kind of where we were sitting where before we introduced the new technology stack of Quasar, we kind of had this where the, the desktop client was only the, the proprietary TCP connections, the launcher would predominantly just use HTTP. So with the websites for auth and federation and, and basically OAuth 2 workflows. And then third party had access to XML APIs and REST APIs. Um, so when we're talking about kind of this uh, fleet of monoliths, right? Like, so there are a number of different nodes, as I understand, that are kind of associated with serving different components. Are they all running the same software stack? Like, is it basically yes. just a question of what you route and what load you assign? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's kind of the, the communication layer. 
in that case is all through the database instance. And so it's, it's responsible for, it's interesting. It's, it's like a cooperative orchestration. Uh, so we have a separate tool that will start those pieces and then they'll ask the database, what am I supposed to be doing? And then they will then, they will then establish links. So uh, the shortest version of this is that the Eve cluster is basically a guaranteed one hop mesh network. Um, which instantly gets you into, you know, some quadratic problems very quickly as far as resources are concerned. Um, but that's basically how it works. And that's how they got away with a lot of the big ideas that people are solving today with, with middleware like Istio and Blinkerd and, and those kind of things. Uh, but the way they built up these pieces was more around um, the, the predictability of the topology. And so like, yeah. there was a lot of like modulus server node ID to get the right one to go to for character data versus corporation data. Um, and so that's kind of how the original, uh, uh, the original network ecosystem evolved itself. And, and then ultimately all the communication between those was done through the database. Um, it is actually interesting. So the database is load bearing here, right? Like the, nothing is oh, talking yes. directly. Yes. Yep. This is this is why uh, like if this is probably over a decade ago, but there's you can probably find an article around the military grade database that uh, CCP was running, um, and this was all because we are just hammering an MSSQL database, not necessarily in the amount of data, but the uh, just the sheer amount of requests that are happening there, and right like, everything think, boils down to IOPS in the end, um, mm -hmm. especially so in this case. Yeah. So let me ask, what was the, what was your observability or lack of observability solution uh, at the time? Like kind of how are you keeping a handle on things in the previous topology? So that was a mixture of a lot of different things. So I think the main one, the, the main thing that, that uh, EveDev was using during those times has to do with the fact that it was built on stackless Python. And so a lot of that was around uh, timing different tasklets, so the coroutines, um, and 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 how long they stayed in certain uh, stayed basically actively scheduled, and then from that those would just kind of basically cry into the error processing, and basically say, hey, this this database call is taking too long, or this certain Python function is taking too long, uh, if you're lucky and you could figure out where that was from, and so there was a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of institutional knowledge around how to read those chicken bones at some point in time, because ultimately, so kind of essentially cryptic error messages is what I'm hearing, right? Like you well, would essentially some, like sometimes they would tell and... you, yeah, sometimes they would tell you exactly where the problem was, and sometimes you would have people that would take a look at it. And you're like, I don't know what this is from, and they would look at it and they're like, oh, if you look at this, this, and this, and this, and this, it points you to this. Like, for example. I remember when we were adding um, like like crash dump processing uh, and 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 modernizing that stack and looking at those and the people would look at that and then we would say well how do you know which line of Python this is on and they could basically look at the evaluation in C plus plus and tell us which line of Python caused the problem like I have no idea how you got there and of course there's like a meticulous way that they went and figured all those pieces out. But a lot of those types of things and a lot of uh, a, a lot of the observability hilariously was from the actual cluster itself. So if something went terribly wrong, you were blind because the thing that was going down was the only thing that could tell you what the problem was. But in most cases, they were isolated so that you could see with the internal tooling what was going on, what was going wrong there. Otherwise, outside of that, it was mostly this CPU is really high and that RAM is about to run out. Ah, I see. Yes, the the traditional like you are about to have a really bad cascading failure. Players are <laughs> yeah, about yeah. complaining. Yeah. And I'm hoping that some of our um, attendees who are not from the games industry will still like hear echoes of this. But right, like in terms of like the you know cryptic problems only the wizards can diagnose, even if they don't have kind of quite those same exact constraints. I think the other really fascinating here thing here um, for for people who are in, in the games industry is like a lot of people think about the APIs as kind of like optional things, right? Like they're, you know, just to, you know, show Steam badges or whatever, right? Like, but the API is load bearing to EVE Online players, right? And I, and I think that that's, that's really unique and makes EVE Online like a lot more kind of the, the uh, 
request response stuff rather than the streaming stuff, a lot more similar to a lot of kind of traditional applications you might see. Yeah, so, so it's my personal opinion that, that the third party APIs have directly impacted the longevity of EVE Online because it's allowed our community to build up some in, insane mechanisms to manage tens of thousands of players in their alliances and corporations uh, and build super interesting websites, um, things like uh, Z Killboard, uh, other applications that everyone would know uh, where, you know, the, I'm a bit old school, so I'll mention Evemon, for example. Um, there's other things, uh, you know, there's other third party tools like uh, fitting uh, assistance, like PIFA, uh, EFT is the super old school one. Um, and all, and some of those were just reverse engineering the rules engine of the game. Uh, uh, to build tools on those types of things. Um, right, so it's got this kind of huge developer ecosystem and people rely on it every day and people apparently gather intel on, uh, on, on each other using, using the API. <laughs> yeah, so this has been a, a point of contention when we started updating the APIs, but it, it, some people use it as a spy check mechanism. Um, and the argument there is that the only spy you're going to catch with the API access is going to be a really bad spy. Um, but yeah, they use it for those things. The, the, I think the other bigger thing is like one of the, so one of the features that we really leaned into kind of the third party uh, API from my memory is when we changed how moon mining works. And ultimately there was a mechanism to manage taxes on the moon mining. And I think basically the team looked at that and went, there are a lot of different ways that we could manage the taxes on this and build a UI around that. None of them are going to be flexible enough to give the players what they need to, to maintain that and do what they want with that information. And so that was one of the first, the first features that I remember when I joined CSP that was that leaned into the third party API and like, we're going to expose this on the third party APIs. So they right. You can just, that. you know, tell people how much, how much they've mined and it's up to the kind of players to figure out how to collect taxes, right? Like sure, all yeah. these kind of governmental or corporation functions, right? Like even online alliances have like better IT infrastructure than, than many medium sized businesses, which I think is really cool. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And that's so also the, of, the, the direct evolution of those, of those groupings as well. Like, Alliances didn't exist in EVE Online until the community started informally having them and then, then they were formalized to a degree in the game itself. And there's a lot of things that have happened like this. Like um, I talk about EVE Mon with like managing your skill queue and those kind of things. There's a evolution of that that's in the game now, which is skill plans, which allows people to manage and plan out what they want to do with their character and that character's time. Yeah, and I think skill plans were the first um, first feature that kind of utilized this new architecture. So why don't you kind of yeah. describe to us what this new architecture is and kind of how it made it easier to develop the skill plans feature as well as you know future future features. So uh, skill plans kind of skips ahead in the, in the history of it, um, and ultimately, like what we call Quasar is is kind of a collection of different technologies. Uh, the beginning of this is when we remove the XML and hypermedia RESTful APIs and replace them with Swagger Spec and Open API based. Uh, like Open API just wasn't there. like it was actually just Swagger Spec back then. Um, and we expose those, and we from all the learnings from the XML and the Crest APIs, we basically landed on like we need to do something where we have more control over how we're deploying and these kind of things. Uh, and how we how we control the traffic and, and, and what resources it uses and, and how quickly we can react to those pieces. And so that's kind of how the basically the the uh, ESI, the uh, Eve Swagger interface um, came along, which we call easy. Um, and that was kind of the first in like that was Quasar in its infancy. We just didn't know it yet. Uh, but that forced us to introduce technologies such as uh, it was Google PubSub at the time. Now we're currently on RabbitMQ. Um, and to, then we then got from JSON messaging into protobuf messaging, which now then led us to gRPC. And then when we got to the gRPC part and realized, wait a minute, we can just put this everywhere. Uh, and this will simplify quite a bit. And that's kind of what this is showing here where we started, we, we basically started consolidating everything into a gRPC, a, a bi-directional streaming connection in gRPC, which then gave us connections to our public gateway, which is a separate 
message bus from our service gateway and, and, and basically that, that separation of concerns there. And then actually <laughs> only until I recently made this picture did I realize how much it had proliferated through our ecosystem and how many teams are actually touched by these things. And it's not necessarily the fact that all of these things have uh, gRPC in them, for instance, like the installer, there's no way we're going to add gRPC dependencies to an installer, uh, but it does use endpoints that are publicly available for that, that eventually get into the Quasar ecosystem. Um, and so ultimately, all of this came through with the, the idea that the message bus was kind of our escape hatch. Um, and that's how we started. Right. Instead of being bottlenecked talking to the MS SQL database, right? Like now right. you have a more flexible mechanism for communicating. Right. And so that then introduced an entire avalanche of different mentalities that weren't directly compatible with how we were doing things in the past. Uh, and so a lot of what we did had to build up from that uh, in the sense of like when we're, when we're doing domain modeling for protobuf, there's a lot of things that we have to break from the old school mentality of Eve, the disambiguations of a lot of, a lot of the models that, that came from working for so long in a dynamically typed language uh, that affects how you model data um, and directly affects how you can expand out of that ecosystem or in some cases can't expand out of that ecosystem. Um, and in kind of the way that we described is, is, you know, how do we get to a point where we can build a service and we won't have a tentacle from the monolith come and pull us back in? Like, how do we right. keep those It's separate? kind of the, um, the, the method where you just start extracting things out of the monolith, right? Like in, in kind of enterprise, it's called the uh, Stringler fig pattern, right? Like where you basically mm -hmm. wrap all the calls in and out of the monoliths, so you know at least what's coming in and out, and then you can kind of start pulling them out into microservices. And, and that was part of, you know, where we got involved with Honeycomb as well, because it got to the point where, like, we can't, we can't possibly reason or see, a, like, what we need to understand about the ingress into the system and the effect that it's having. Egress, not necessarily a big problem, but the ingress, we needed to understand where that was coming from, especially since we introduced uh, Easy for third party and added a mobile client on top of that, which used that ecosystem as well. Uh, so now we were seeing a lot more, we were seeing a lot different traffic patterns than before. Um, right. And I think that's where you started like reading about cardinality, as I understand, right? Like because API clients are the ultimate high cardinality. Yeah. So that was, that was one of the interesting things as it, as we started trying to build uh, metrics against how, you know, how many, what types of messages were coming in, how we were processing them. Um, then it became interesting to the point of, okay, well, we can't use a counter in Prometheus for this because our message types keep growing and growing and growing. And that just falls over almost immediately. Uh, and so, you know, cardinality is kind of ultimately how we discovered Honeycomb. I literally, I think, searched for high cardinality observability at that point in time, just smashed those two words together and Honeycomb popped out of Google. Um, and then we started hooking up tracing in our first attempt uh, which is only for the monolith services themselves. So this again was before Quasar was really crystallized in our mind. Um, and we started discovering all sorts of interesting ways that this, this ecosystem was operating. Uh, you know, we've discovered bizarre things like request response times were based on gameplay mechanics in some degree. So in a sense in, in Eve, when you target another ship, that takes time based on your skills and the ship and how big that ship is versus how strong your sensor strength is and like all these other different mechanics. And we, when we first took up tracing, we're like, man, these calls are super slow. They're like 30 seconds. What's taking, what's, why is that taking forever? And then we realized, oh, it's the gameplay logic that holds the request and then responds when it actually locks a target. So at some point someone could cause an alarm to fire at CCP HQ if they lock a pod in a Titan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then there'd be a massive span for like four days or however long it takes to do that. Um, and yeah, we found all sorts of interesting things like that, how, how there were like over the years had built up all of these. It's, it's like, imagine, imagine like one of those, you know, uh, like uh, almost like a cyberpunk sci-fi where there's just all these little robots running around and doing stuff. And then we basically applied honeycomb and then we could see all of them crawling around and we're like, what is that? What is that doing? Um, and, and all of this comes from kind of the other, the other interesting cultural fact of, 
EVE Online has a daily downtime. So every day at 11 GMT, we, we reboot the servers. And that usually takes like a minute, maybe two minutes. And then that's also when we deploy um, different code and change those types of things. Um, but then it also kind of highlighted some of the other weirdness that we were seeing there where things would cross that boundary between downtime and then some other odd leftovers that might be hanging around. Uh, but yeah, that, that's when we first get in there. And then, and then when we got to building Quasar, we realized really fast, we're like, okay, this whole message bus thing and the experience that we had in the early days when we were working with a mobile app and Google Pub Sub and all in the JSON, like we learned a lot of things real fast, like, you know, have a strict schema and you, you need tracing. Like you need tracing to really understand what's going on, how quickly the messages are being processed, where they're getting stuck. It even helped us inside of our monolith services as well uh, to kind of identify if we if we put out a, a third party endpoint and it was new and then started hammering the monolith services then we could pinpoint like is it is it the logic inside the service or is it the actual database call that's taking a long time um, and that would help us and previously you had little visibility into that it was just like mm -hmm. at that at that level yeah at that level it was completely like you didn't, you basically got in the neighborhood, but like the tracing allows us to like pick a room in a house, basically. Um. Yeah, so getting back to the launch of skill plans, right? Like, so you'd been kind of iterating on the API for a while, but that was just changes to the API, right? Like that was mostly still running in your data centers. And at some point you were also like, you know, hey, like this is kind of silly to be limited limit by our own bare metal hardware. Let's go to AWS. How long ago did that start? And like kind of what was what was that roadmap like in parallel, kind of migrating from both, you know, monolith to microservices and also mi migrating from on-prem to cloud at the same time? It, it was <laughs> liberating and frustrating at the same time in the sense that we, you know, we eventually wound up in AWS. We mentioned Google PubSub as well. We kind of went from them into AWS was our final resting point at this point in time. And that's probably, that's at least been for four, if not five years for now. Um, and basically getting the, like having people understand that they can just deploy now is so huge to what we were doing. It, it, we basically brushed up against the existing culture in Eve Dev where we're like, cool, let's deploy this tomorrow. And they're like, oh, no deployments tomorrow. And we're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why, what do you mean? Like, oh, we, we're, we're not doing anything tomorrow because we don't want any noise over the weekend. Right, okay. it's, it's almost the no Friday deploys taken to extreme where it's like, you can only deploy on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. That is patch day and no, there is there is no yeah. other patch day. I mean, the, like the, the, the extremes there were, were more like, it wasn't it wasn't like black and white. It was, it was more of the fact that like, hey, if there's an emergency that we need to fix, sure, we'll deploy whenever. But if it's more like, hey, I got this new shiny thing, everyone's like, nah, <laughs> that's not happening. Um, and we were kind of pushing the limit on how frequently we would deploy things uh, but we were also at the stage of this migration that if we <laughs> if we broke something, everything was broken. Like it wasn't nuanced; it was literally everything comes crashing down. Um, so we had that. Like some might think that that's a disadvantage, but that was a big advantage for us because we didn't have tracing at that point either. Um, and then as it became more and more nuanced, as the pieces that we were pulling out, that became more and more important to kind of watch our step when we were moving through those older systems. So you have at this point, right? Like that was kind of one of the questions we got from the player base. I asked on Reddit slash r slash Eve, like what questions should I ask uh, Nick? And one of the questions that came out was basically like, are there plans to migrate previously existing services? And it sounds like it's already happened, right? Seamlessly under the hood without fanfare, it just happened. So one of the big ones, yeah, absolutely. Like, well, our team tries to stay away from uh, public facing things. Uh, because we don't UI so well. Um, and basically the things that we've done in the hood is an interesting exercise in event sourcing where <laughs> there's this odd reality in the, in the monolith services where you are in space, like what solar system you're in and where you, where you lit, like where your actual capsule and spaceship and character is, is almost... <laughs> Like it's almost a quantum state, depending on what you ask, you'll get a different answer 
from a system at large. And, right, and, like the uh, Titans that died and didn't die because they were in two different systems at the same time. Yeah, right? yeah that's you an get, extreme, yeah. extreme system. That's an extreme version of that, absolutely. Mostly it's, it's pretty well localized. All the systems that need to operate are very localized. But when you start building out uh, foundational services to support all that, you start finding all these edge cases where you realize that no, like even when we started building APIs, no one ever asked the question, where am I? Because they never needed to know the answer to that. And because of that, there was never any path to get to the actual source of truth. Because when Eve is running, there's two sources of truth, Python memory and the database. And depending on when persistence happens, ugh, it's anybody's ball game. And then the, what you're talking about with the, 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 the Titan example, yeah, that's one of those things where that got delayed or there was a graceful part of the shutdown was like, I don't know where this is, so I'm gonna save it anyway. So we'd rather have Titans in two places rather than no places, right? Um, and then fix those later in those kind of situations. Uh, I forgot where that ramble so, was going, honestly. So yeah, basically, but one of the examples I think that got moved over relatively early on was the chat system, uh, right? Like yes. that was kind of one of the examples of the uh, of migrating yeah. to the hood, and 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 that was uh, a little bit more visible to players than than I think many of us. Wow. Yeah. So uh, we introduced XMP, an XMPP cluster into the ecosystem. This was before Quasar, kind of a little bit after. Or I actually don't know about the timing, but it might have been after Easy came out as well, um, and and that was a different part of the company learning the same the same problems at the same time, and that's also what influenced us a lot on like how do we help people do this more cleanly and, and not end up in these situations, um, and you know that's outside the monolith, but it, it didn't really give us any of the value from moving it outside the monolith, and so it became one of the things that we targeted as far as, you know, what did we want to get rid of first? And that's kind of how we got into the whole uh, event sourcing presence um, with Quasar, because that's also part of like the test that we've been doing behind the scenes uh, with a new version of chat where the data is exclusively, well, the local channel, so local channels in EVE or who's in a solar system, which very quickly becomes Twitch chat uh, for certain solar systems. And that's not really conducive to any off the shelf chat mechanism. Uh, so like XMPP like doesn't want 9,000 people spamming uh, Ponzi schemes in, in their chat channel. Like that's just not what it's built for. And um, also XMPP like is not sufficiently reliable because again, like anything that is an API becomes like abused by players, used by players, right? Like it's Intel on who might potentially be hunting. Yeah, that's, that's the other tricky part. Like it, it's interesting, like the, we talked to some of the devs who were who dealt with pre XMP, like the original chat system. And like one of the things that they brought into our, our view when we started working on like the having presence event sourced in this system and authoritative and, and correct, more importantly, correct. And we also used Honeycomb to verify that as well. Um, they're like, the timing on this is important because if somebody jumps from one system to another, when they can see the other person is there or has left the other location is important as Intel because of how people move through systems or how people prepare to attack or defend gates. Um, and so these were also interesting problems that kind of bleed into even the foundational pieces. So you kind of had the monolith protocol and then you moved to XMPP and finally it wound up as I understand on gRPCs, right? Like, and finally being like traceable by Honeycomb. Yeah, so, but we, we still don't have that one publicly available yet. It's still a, a, a kind of an experiment behind the scenes. So let's talk about experiments behind the scenes, right? Like one of the, in addition to using Honeycomb here, you're also using LaunchDarkly, right? Like you're also like using feature yeah. flags and otherwise kind of being able to, I think the theme I'm picking up here is being able to iterate more quickly, right? Like being able to deploy to a microservice on AWS to kind of gracefully shift over traffic to a new version without anyone noticing and potentially using feature flags to control it, right? Like, and all of that without having to push to the monolith. Yeah, so that's, that's, you listed quite a few cultural changes that we've been working on. Um, yeah, so anytime you needed to change one thing, you needed to push the entire war machine out the window and hope that it landed okay. Um, and so- and how with, long does that take, right? Like that, that monolith build, like how long, how long does it take, you know, compared to deploying an individual microservice today with Quasar? Uh, like, I mean, this is one of the success stories that we have internally where in EVE, discovering depending on where the problem is and what the severity of it is 
you know, you have multiple hours before you can actually deploy a fix for things. Um, the version of that for Quasar at this point in time, the, the best story that we've had so far is, you know, somebody discovered, discovered the problem and deployed it in like 30 minutes. Um, that was kind of the best. Right. So it kind of takes now. both of those things together. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Like if it's going to take you 24 hours or, or heaven forbid, 168 hours before you can deploy a fix, right? Like the fact that it takes you an extra like hour or two to figure it out, eh, right? Like, you know, yes, it's annoying, but like it's, it doesn't make a big difference in the grand scheme of things. But when you can fix things quickly, then discovering them quickly becomes like vital to that feedback loop. The, the other subtlety there is how many people it took to deploy that. With the 30 minute fix in Quasar, that was one person. Mm. With the deployment of the monolith, well, you have to online people that have access to the data center, that have access to builds. You maybe even have to have a smoke test at some point in time, which means you need to deploy it to other servers that you might not have access to. Um, and so th that's one of the bigger cultural changes. But I think the biggest one with things like Launch Darkly and Future Flags is, is we're still learning the power of the difference between a deployment and a release. Um, Eve has only deployed and released at the same time. And kind of what we're what we're talking about here is that with like the local chat work that we're doing, we're constantly deploying and releasing, but not necessarily to the customers. Um, so we're, we're actually watching what happens in the ecosystem with live data. Like we've joked about this a couple of times, but like, <laughs> like the Eve client is basically our own little botnet for our universe. And so we use it to and try even out all these right? Like you can get yeah. client end-to-end -end traces. And I've seen some of the cool stuff, right? Like you have honeycomb traces flowing from EVE Online clients that let you get real user monitoring. I yeah, and we can, yeah cool. and we can see like that, that was one of the other big things where, you know, there was a point in time where we had like huge DDoS attacks and that made us re like revisit our, our network ecosystem and how that was working and, and how people were staying connected. Uh, and brought up the conversation around TCP and, you know, the fact that we're using HTTP2 TCP for gRPC, the fact that we might move over to quick when that becomes available and all the different tech stacks that we have. Um, but then being able to see like from the actual client into the ecosystem, being able to see first, middle and last mile is a pretty big deal. Yeah. And how are CCP devs feeling about this, right? Like uh, many people have been at the company, you know, 10 years, 15 years, like, are people excited about it? Are people like, oh my God, my job security? Like what, what's the sentiment towards Quasar? I, I think I think people are still learning. <laughs> like we're still in the point where like, yeah, that should go into Quasar. And then it, it, somebody goes, what's that? Like we're still in that phase. Like, <clears throat> people should, like it's still a, a vocabulary that people are learning. I, I think that the other piece of it is Right, that, it's a fundamentally new tech stack, right? Like yeah. the joke almost is that you skip like three generations of technology and you're moving on to the newest and greatest, which means that like none of the nouns and verbs are the same. Yeah, and, and, and it's only recently that we have teams in the feature teams, like building things like skill plans and some other features uh, around, uh, like, I think we have like a, a recommendation service that kind of recommends for new players what they should try out next. Um, those kind of services all built in Quasar. And the success that those teams are having and, and kind of the, the speed that they're working at, because the, the, biggest, the biggest hurdle in adoption was the, the kind of the, the the learning speed bump of it all. But ultimately we learned that it was less about the technology that needed to be learned and more about the cultural changes that happened in between. Because we started learning about what, how does a monolith condition engineering practices in the sense of, you know, we started working with teams and, and, and you know, working with sessions with them about like, okay, we're gonna put this on Quasar and this is how it's gonna go. And then ask things like, yeah, okay, what if this message doesn't get sent? Like, where do I look for that? And like, you don't, you tell us, that's not your problem. And and that that change of culture from having to worry about absolutely everything in a monolith to having an entire section of it be like, no, there's a team that's got your back to make sure all of that stuff works. That is the biggest- Ah, that change. kind of gets the hesitance, right? Like people are like, oh my God, I don't want to go on call for all of it, right? Like when you're like, I yeah. want you to like own your own services. But it turns out when we say own your own services, we mean literally just your service. Yeah, yeah. And 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 and, it, and it's that's still evolving as well. We, we're still trying to understand how that works for our culture. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of a big part of it as well. With, with Honeycomb, and we're talking about these things, you know, I've kind of described it as kind of a, <laughs> On, on our Slack channels, it, like if there's an incident of some kind, it becomes this interesting poker match where everybody starts pasting their graphs of what the problem is. 
Um, and you know that used to range from the internal graphs to like the system admins posting like CPU and memory graphs. And that's evolved into like, you know, links to things like Datadog or links to things like Sentry or things to things like, um, uh, what was it? Grafana is the biggest one right now. Right, your Prometheus and Grafana instance, yep. Yeah, but the biggest one that's kind of stops everything is, is basically posting Honeycomb because if anybody has a question after that, it's highly unlikely simply because everything is there. Like we, there, you can explore all those different pieces and see what actually is going on with like where where the problem space is. Um, and, and that's kind of how it goes. Like it's, it's almost like a one-upping mechanism in Slack. And so that's kind of how our adoption has happened as well with the exposure of these things where it's, you know, getting people to dig into Honeycomb has been more about, we post a link to Honeycomb in Slack and then a graph shows up, you can click on it they go straight to Honeycomb and they can dig into all of the data that's there. And I think that's what they're not used to in the sense of like, oh, do I have access to the system? Like one of the subtle but super important things for us was having SSO on Honeycomb. That way anybody could get in, see the data and figure out what's going on. Right, no need to SSH to a server to fetch the logs. And even if you get the logs, you can't even understand it, right? Like now it's sure. accessible to and comprehensible to everyone, which helps people wrap their head around kind of figuring out what's my service, what's, you know, what's Nick's problem. Yeah, Excellent. I think, um, it, kind it, of... sorry, that, that, that's a big part of the cultural piece of, of being able to start building teams that can rely on one another is understanding where those boundaries are. And when you can visualize those with tracing, that is huge because it's so obvious. Awesome. Um, so kind of one last canned question from kind of the player base before we start taking live questions is, um, Melkanis, uh, who's an e player that says e even my name, like asks, you know, why should I care about Quasar as anything but a redirection of the dev resources that Eve needs urgently? To which I, I reframe it to be like, you know, less rude and say like, you know, how do you balance like paying down technical debt versus delivering features, right? Like, you know, what, why, why not just, you know, deliver deliver more and better features faster? Like, kind of, what was that trade off like? So originally when this all started, it was around the idea that we did some napkin math and we're like, hey, if we, if we snapped our fingers and 100,000 players showed up, it would not be a good day for anyone. Like we would not survive that. Um, so that's initially what the research started with and, and how we were gonna grow those pieces. And now it's more about, Eve has become a very, and I, and I I, I try not to say the word complex, I use the word dense quite a bit. There's just so much in Eve and so few humans that we have to actually iterate or maintain on Eve. And the cultural aspect of these types of changes with Quasar are more important in that question than the technology. Because ultimately it allows teams to then focus on, okay, we now have yet another system for people to experience content. Like if you were to name off things like missions, uh, career agents, uh, the incursions, the invasions, all of these different things that have all these pieces and they basically like these one shot kind of things that happen and then just stay in the sandbox. And then ultimately because they stay in the sandbox and other things start latching onto them, they ossify and nobody can touch them. Uh, in, in the postcode what, being like one of the classical examples yeah, sure. of both yes. a thing that you can't touch because it has tendrils everywhere, and also yeah. that you have to test against because everything else will, could potentially break it. It's it's that it's that one like open source meme of the entire castle that's built in one guy's open source like library. Ours is pause code right there, right? Um, but yeah, like the cultural aspect of that is is the biggest part of this is the biggest value because it allows it allows teams to not have to spend so much cognitive power figuring out what it is that they actually need to care about. And then what like, the idea over time is that we can start compressing, like mm, compress is the wrong word, um, renovating a lot of these, a lot of this density and making it more normalized in the system. Like what actually matters? Like another, another, another version of this that I know a lot of people want to talk about is like factional warfare, those types of things. But there's just so many systems that we have to find a way to, to kind of help the culture be able to wrangle those pieces in a sane way. And, and part so of that is- To kind is of paraphrase the, this, right? Like almost 
you know, number one, this is not like a huge investment that it diverted CCP, right? Like you didn't stop all development for six months or a year or two years to do this, right? Like it, it was all incremental and kind of along the way. This is just the first time you're giving it a name, number one. And number two, the thing that I'm hearing is that many of the game design changes that players had been asking for were not possible with the old architecture, right? Like the, you had to change the architecture in order to be able to contemplate, you know, as you're saying, like even being able to, to think about like redoing faction worker, like that wouldn't be possible, like in the old architecture, it would just take too long, it would be too slow. So for like the, to just like, investing in the to prevent us from getting too hand wavy about those kind of things, I have, I have a concrete example of that. We introduced a, a concept called shared bookmarks at some point in time. And shared bookmarks is unique because they're on the screen right now. Shared bookmarks right here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll be damned. Uh, so shared bookmarks is interesting because they have a unique routing problem. They are dynamically routed. And that's not something, if you remember what we talked about at the beginning of this, everything is predestined. You do modulus something to get the route to another place. Shared bookmarks aren't that because they are completely dynamic. And the whole concept of sharing things and, and ACLs, and this is why ACLs are complex in general in the design of things. Um, because ultimately when you have a guaranteed one hop mesh network, you need to know where the next hop is. But when everything's dynamic, that instantly becomes a problem. And so for things like Quasar, that's not a problem because beh like behind the scenes, Erling's doing its job with RabbitMQ and routing it and multiplying it wherever we want it to go on the fly. We don't have to care about that. But with the shared bookmark system, they had to do a lot of interesting and unique to probably about only three or four other features in the entire cluster in order to pull that off. And even then they had to apply heavy limitations on how many shared bookmarks there can be, who, how many people can actually share them, these types of things. So all of those start to melt away as well. Cool, excellent. Um, so now let's, we've got 10 minutes left. Let's go ahead and take some questions. Um, I think we answered this, this one, um, you know, earlier, where's Honeycomb in the new architecture? I think the answer is it's everywhere, right? Like it's built in. <laughs> yeah, our, our current journey with that is that we we did an initial integration with the with the monolith services itself before we understood what tracing was. So it was kind of like my first <laughs> tracing project with a massive monolith. Uh, and then we we learned what that was when we started to adopt things like open telemetry and the semantic conventions around open telemetry. Uh, and that really kind of solidified our understanding about what that meant. And so one of the things that we're currently working on now is getting that, that semantic, those semantic conventions applied to the earlier stage stuff that we did, connecting traces. So now that we see things go all the way through the system, we still have a little bit of a segmentation right now, but we're actively working on joining that into one piece so that people can see a single trace go through the entire ecosystem. Yeah, um, we've got a question from Matt who asks, do you have metrics and logs in separate systems? What does it look like if you're trying to correlate metrics, logs, and traces? Uh, logs are the devil. If you're using logs, you're doing it wrong. That's basically our general rule or my general rule. Um, if you think you need to look at logs, then it probably needs to be some kind of error reporting mechanism. And if it's something where you just need to know the frequency of, it should probably be a metric. And in the case where you need to know the semantics of something or the details of something, it should be a trace. There should be right. no it kind of, if it resolve, if it involves kind of timing and causation, right? Like that's kind of the sweet spot for a trace. Um, so basically it sounds like you're using them for completely disjoint purposes, right? Like, you know, you've got metrics to measure like CPU usage, player count, but you've got traces for anything that's like a request response, like whether it be, you know, in, in both directions or streaming to GRPC. Yeah, especially to understand where it goes in the ecosystem tracing, nothing can be tracing in that regard. Um, from metrics is more about finding the ballpark of where the problem is and then using tracing to then zero in on where the actual problem space is. And you're starting to experiment, as I understand, with getting them all into one tool rather than kind of having, you know, your your Prometheus cluster and and, and Honeycomb. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> I mean, if if we had to figure out how many, what was OOM killed the most in our cube, it would probably be Prometheus nodes. Yeah. Um, how do you, another question that came up, uh, how do you trace like RabbitMQ in the message bus? Like kind of, how does that work? Because that's definitely not request response. It's kind of a little off the beaten path. Mm. Yeah, so there's other liberties that we've taken with some open telemetry semantics. Um, we basically treat everything as request and response, but uh, we try to track those, those spans or where they land on the other side of those pieces. So 
Uh, we actually formalized a lot of the open telemetry spec into our messages. Uh, so basically the primitives that we have in our ecosystem have trace context in them uh, and have relevant flags that we care about, which is mostly if it's sampled or not. And then the trace ID and the parent ID and those types of things, or trace ID, yeah. Um, and then we just rebuild it from there. It, 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 when, you, when you get your brain around tracing, it, it all works out once you just follow some simple rules. It, and, it's, and it makes complex systems very straightforward very quickly. Yeah, so basically, you know, even if you have like, you know, a player session, right, like I might log in at, you know, at downtime in Australia and just keep my client running through the next downtime, right, like, and that's completely supported, right, to have a 24 hour session. But you don't actually have 24 hour traces because you're chopping it into no, little bits that right, are all trace yeah, linked together. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Donald in the chat is asking, like, why not just completely rewrite the entire source code? Like, is Quasar kind of a route towards rewriting everything? Um, kind of how's how does that play into the longevity of the game so that you know even exists for another 20 years? If you want to get anything done with technology in a company, never say the word rewrite. That's my pro tip to everyone. Um, this is, you could look at it that way. Hopefully if you fast forward 10 years, maybe I can claim that if all of this is still wandering around the internet, but, um, it's more about taking a second iteration on, on how these things have built and what we've learned from it and how to streamline that. So I don't necessarily look at it as a rewrite, but more of an iterative process on what we've already done. And the tricky part about that is you have to do that in small chunks. You have to deliver value with what you're doing. It's the same with when we did. Right. No one introduced... rewrites a system for the sake of rewriting a system, right? Like there has to yeah. be a reason. And I think that goes to Malkanis's point about, you know, no, you don't just rewrite things because you want to, right? Like that's a diversion of resources, right? Like you're writing things in order to make them scalable systems on which the game on which the uh, right. game designers and, and, can and build mechanics. We, we've proven and since we've we've proven the value of kind of the cultural shift and the abilities this gives a team to really actually be responsible and own a service and control it from start to finish. The next part of that is how do we enrich the ecosystem so people can build more things? Cool. Um, John has been asking this question for a while. High finality was the previous scaling challenge. What's the current scaling limit? CPU core speed, like uh, queue throughput, network bandwidth. I'm not sure actually that question is well formed, right? Like high kernality was the problem you had in observing the system, right? The, the yes. problem in the system was cognitive bandwidth to which high kernality was a limitation of your previous tools rather than high kernality necessarily directly slowing down your system. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can answer, like if we split those into two things, like so high kernality, I guess the next problem there after high kernality is quota. <laughs> so <laughs> managing quota is the next problem because you can send everything. Um, so it's not really a technological limitation, more like a wallet limitation. Uh, right, right, and it was a wallet limitation for both, right? Like hard cardinality wouldn't have worked with your Prometheus, like you would have been unable to send that many unique tags, right? So you switch to Honeycomb, everything's great, except for now you need to sample or kind of adjust your code. Uh, yeah, yeah, we haven't talked about sampling it so much. much. Yeah. Sampling is pretty, like sampling is probably the more complex thing to wrap your head around to do correctly in an ecosystem. Uh, than really instrumenting it, to be honest. Um, that's that's one of the trickier parts. Cool. So kind of there's a scaling challenge of your observability tooling, but there's all, kind of also the question of, okay, so now you've kind of gotten rid of the cognitive complexity, kind of where, what's the kind of crafty stuff that's holding you back, whether it be kind of code systems, whether it be kind of CPU bottlenecks. I imagine like the MS SQL database is kicking around, right? Like that, that feels like it's the... Um, I mean, we, we've become exceedingly efficient at, at writing procs in, in MS SQL, that's, that's for sure. Um, I, I, the main thing is CPU, the main cruft is stackless Python. The fact that, so just real quickly, stackless Python does one thing at a time always. Um, and, and no matter what you do, there's no, there's no actual threads. Everything's happening sequentially in order. Oh God, it's single threaded per, yeah. per, per shard. Yes. Oh God. Okay. Yes. So that is probably the biggest one there. And kind of one of the other reasons why we've looked at, you know, hey, let's, you know, add gRPC on a separate C++ thread and then, you know, have, have a, a polling mechanism where we can interact with those pieces. But the, the idea, like one of the other speed ups optimizations that done in the past was um, IOCP. So uh, input output completion ports, 
uh, where basically it it utilized the kernel more to put more track like to put more data uh, at the OS level. That way we could switch in and off faster. Right. Yeah. There's this kind of trollish comment on Reddit about you know oh task switching, but it turns out like you're running single threaded in Stackless Python, right? Like anything you can do to move things out of the monolith out of Stackless Python onto AWS your language of choice even, right? Like because it's all gRPC, right? Like that that feels like that's kind of how you improve performance. It's how you reduce tie-dye, right? Like yeah. if you just move the bounty system off to a separate process or if you move, you know. Yeah, right? and, and we're toying with things as well where, you know, maybe the simulation frames go over Quasar. Maybe more of the information that's in space goes over Quasar. Um, we're still very early stages theory crafting about what we can do there. Excellent. Well, let's take like maybe one or two more questions. And um, but before we do that, uh, just so I don't run out of time and forget to mention it, uh, there is an event survey. So um, please do take this survey that's on your screen. We're curious to hear your feedback on what you've heard so far. Um, and if you're not an EVE Online player um, or you would like to share EVE Online with someone in your life, um, there is a CCP game starter pack code uh, for EVE Online that you can share with uh, that, that you can use yourself or share with your friends if you're one of the first 50 respondents. Cool. Um, so I think lastly, um, kind of one of the one of the final questions is like, what sampling strategy do you use? Like, do you trace every request? Like, kind of how does that work on the back end? How do you make that work? Uh, so we discovered the glorious uh, exponential moving average sampling technique, um, which ultimately is uh, some fancy math that allows you to sample based on the frequencies of keys that show up. And that key space, as it grows and shrinks based on those frequencies, dynamically change the sampling rate. So instead of us needing to worry about, oh, something like this one event that's, you know, if we instrumented every X, Y coordinate of the mouse, it, ultimately we can basically tell EMA sampling, we want you to target this goal overall in the ecosystem. And then it tries to achieve that for, for that localized instance. Um, so that allows us, it, it's this great balance between automatically uh, reducing the noise from high frequency while making sure that lower frequency events are sampled. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Nick. And thank you to all of the folks who tuned in to attend. Yeah, thanks guys.